Hey, uh, my name is Tim Amaral, I'm the senior pastor here. Thanks for coming this morning. So glad that you're with us to worship the Lord. Uh, I want to just uh, just inform you that I did not get an elk. So I blame it on you. Uh, you guys aren't praying hard enough, apparently. And so we're going to start in June of next year, prayer and fasting. We're going to see if Pastor Tim can get an elk next year. Okay? But, but we had a blast. My son and I, my son's uh, active duty in the military and... Uh, he was, he's over uh, stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas. He was able to take a week off, and so we got in the mountains together. It was such an awesome time. We enjoyed ourselves. Uh, past, uh, Elder Ellen Buckley did an incredible job last week uh, talking about abiding in Christ. What an appropriate message right after elections that we're not looking to a man or to uh, an institution to uh, legislate righteousness. We look to Christ. He is our all in all. And so I thought it was appropriate message for last week. Um, so thank you so much, Alan. Great, great message. Um, also wanted to say uh, this last Monday was Met Veterans Day. Anybody veterans in our house today? Anybody that's a veteran? Will you stand up? We want to just say thank you for your service. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. <clears throat> This is what keeps our country the way it is, is people willing to sacrifice themselves for our freedom. And so what a, what a picture of Christ as well. So thank you guys so much. Also, how many of you guys are into missions? Anybody uh, into missions? Just nobody. Nobody cares about missions. I mean, people are overseas. They put their life on the line and nobody cares. No, God cares. But, but listen, I want to uh, let you know that every month we put out a missions prayer list for the missionaries that we support. If you're curious about who we support missions-wise, uh, you can grab one of the missions prayer lists, which is on the bistro table on the way out the door. Grab one of those. Um, engage in prayer for these people, man. They're, they're really kind of out on their own. And so, you know, it's, it's churches like ours that support these people that are out doing the work that God is calling them to do. And not just financially, but also through prayer, man. These guys need covered in prayer. You can also get the, the prayer list on the app. So if you go to more, it's the bottom right-hand corner of the app. And then you can go to the, the, it'll bring you to the next tab, which is you'll see some folders. One of them says missionary prayer list. Just click in there. You can see them all from the past, but... The, the current one is in November, so you can check it out there. I also want to uh, direct you to a, a group that we have in our app under Get Connected. You can go to the Missions Minded uh, group, and that group actually is not just the missionaries we support, but we have a lady in our church, Felice Nations, who is a missionary to missionaries, and so she brings... Uh, keeps you up to date on all the things God is doing with the various different hundreds of ministries that she's part of, that she's, uh, you know, making aware, people aware of what's going on in the various places across the nation, uh, across the world, really. So uh, join that group if you'd like to stay in touch with uh, just missions in general. And then finally, how many of you guys have ever heard of the movie 22 Words? 22 words. You guys remember the, the last, I think, year or so, there was a pastor that was going across the United States going into school boards and speaking about the kind of content that children were engaging in in the libraries of our country. And so this pastor said, enough is enough. I'm not going to uh, stand for this anymore. So he went to all these school boards across the nation and he, he documented all of the different places. And it's amazing. I, I've already previewed it. We're hosting it here December 13th, you can get more information on the app about it, but it's really an amazing journey, and you can see the, the spiritual battle that exists across our country, you guys, just in, in terms of the, the, the people trying to protect things that are just insane. And so this pastor stands in, before school boards and speaks the truth, and most of the time it's not received. Which, uh, so we're going we're gonna to host that movie here uh, on December uh, 13th at 6.30, so you can get more information on the app. So that does it in the way for announcements for me. So uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're just weeks away from completing our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of 1 Corinthians. How many of you guys have been through the whole book with us? You've gone all the way through verse-by-verse. -verse. Man, it's been a life-changing study for me, and I hope it has been for you. Well, uh, the last few weeks, we've been considering the incredible topic of the resurrection of the dead. And that was kind of the last doctrinal 
conversation that Paul has with this church. So he turns now in chapter 16 from correction to exhortation, from doctrinal to practical. And so we find ourselves in verses one through four this morning looking at the topic of giving. And so uh, if you're a guest with us, we don't cherry pick uh, these topics. Uh, We teach the Bible verse by verse. And so we come across whatever the Lord has for us in in the weeks to come. So We're in chapter 16, looking at verses 1 through 4 with a message entitled, A Collection Conversation. Stand with me once you're there. We're going to read our text this morning and then dive into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, what an, what an important topic we're here to consider this morning as we Just go journey through your word, and we ask you, Lord, to open our hearts to your spirit this morning, that your spirit will lead us into all truth relating to this. There's so many preconceived ideas relating to this topic, and the enemy has used it in such such deplorable ways, Lord, to uh, just get our hearts off the main thing, which is you. So we ask you this morning to help me rightly divide the word this morning, but may we have hearts to to hear and to receive what it is that you would have to say to us personally. So we sit at your feet this morning. We ask you to speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can be seated. There's been, uh, it's been said that there are three things that you should never talk about with anybody. That is a religion, uh, uh, politics, and money. I personally like to talk about all three of those things every time I have a conversation with people because, uh, not because I'm, I'm, I like to speak controversial but because I like to speak about substance. Isn't it interesting that like, when it comes to politics, I'm not interested in politics, but as it relates to a biblical worldview, those, that's the kind of conversations I'm interested in. And the Bible has a lot to say about all three of these things. And so this morning, we're going to talk about biblical Christianity and money. And I preface it with biblical Christianity because the word Christian has lost its true meaning in our culture today. I mean, a lot of people call themselves Christians and so the definition of Christian uh, can mean anybody who believes in a Christ. The Mormons call themselves Christians. The Jehovah Witnesses call themselves Christians. Do you know they, they serve a different Christ than you do? I'm talking about the Christ of the Bible and what the Christ of the Bible has to say relating to the topic of money. And it's so important that we understand these things. Uh, Now, just the idea of even talking about finances in the church, uh, you know, has lost some of you. And I can relate to that. I was there. I had the preconceived notion as an unbeliever when I came into the church that all the church wants is my money. Anybody else have that preconceived idea? Like you come in like, the church only wants my money. Of course they're going to talk about money today because all they want to talk about is money. You know, and um, you know, I had that mentality, well, until I got saved, number one, and then I got discipled in the word of God relating to this subject. And so there's some things I want to kind of lay a base for you relating to giving in general at first. And then we're going to go verse by verse through our our text this morning. But I want to start just talking about this idea of giving. And there's really three things I want to lay out for you. Number one, the thing that you need to understand about giving in the Bible is it is first and foremost an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship to God. It's important to note that giving is an act of worship, not a transaction for personal gain. And I think it's important to say the last part of that as well, because there are teachers in the Bible that take this subject and they use it to their advantage, and they're called charlatans. And they utilize the scriptures to fleece the flock of God to get into your pocketbooks to get as much out of you as you can, as they can. 
You know, and they say things like, if you give God $10, he's going to give you 100 back. If you give God $1,000, he's going to give you 10000 back. You know, God loves to give back to you if you'll just give to him and trust him. You know, empty your bank account today. Here's my personal name. Just write the check out to me and we'll be, we'll be great. You know, and it's these kinds of people. And it's this kind of message that all God cares, that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and rolling in a bends. It's these kinds of things that uh, charlatans use, and, and they are preaching what's called a false doctrine of prosperity gospel. And I want you to know that the only person prospering in, under that tutelage of uh, those kinds of people is the person giving the message. The people who sit in churches that, you know, propagate this kind of a message, all you're doing is buying these people cars and houses and planes and all of these kinds of things. And that is the purpose of it. And the devil has used uh, man, the greed of man from the beginning of time to get our eyes off of the real principles of the, of, of, of the biblical issue relating to money. God it's an act of worship to God. Of course the devil doesn't want you to worship God in that way. He wants to keep you under his thumb. And so he wants to give you an improper perspective relating to this thing. Listen, the devil is behind the prosperity gospel and he's behind people who fleece the flock of God. I wanna say um, that we're gonna talk about this just in a, just a little bit, but there is this idea and this is where these charlatans get it, that there's a circle of blessing relating to giving. As an act of worship, when you give to God, the Bible certainly says that God gives back. But listen, we don't give to get. That's not the mentality of the believer. The believer is, I give because God is God. And he's worthy of it first and foremost. Even beyond everything that he's done in your life, he is worthy of us giving if you wouldn't do anything in your life because he's God. He's worthy of it. And secondly, we praise him for what he's done. And, and of course, that motivates us as well. But uh, God is worthy of our worship. And in particular, worthy of our worship through our giving. It's an expression to God relating to our gratitude for who he is and for all that he's done. Secondly, giving is a matter of obedience. Uh, hear me when I say this. God does not need your money. Does that relieve you this morning? Because if we were serving a God that was dependent on you, man, that's not a God I'm interested in serving. Because he, he's not dependent on you, thank God. He's not dependent on me either. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your obedience. The quickest way for God to show you how you're faring in the obedience department is for him to ask you for something that is near and dear to your heart. It's for him to ask you for something that means something to you. That's how you can tell whether you're obedient or not. When God asks you to give of your money as an act of worship, your response reveals your heart. Jesus illustrates this with his encounter with the rich young ruler. You might recall this story. This man comes to Jesus and he asks him, how do I get to heaven? And isn't it interesting that Jesus points him to the answer that he's looking for, the Ten Commandments. The guy wants to think that he can get to heaven by checking boxes and doing, by, by doing the right things or not doing the right, or, and not doing the wrong things. And so Jesus says, well, you know what the, the word says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So that's the Ten Commandments. It's, Jesus is pointing him to that. It's interesting, he'll show him in just a second, uh, you know, really his fault. But do you know what his response was to Jesus, teacher? All these things I have done since my youth. He's essentially saying, I'm righteous. I've done all the right things, Jesus. I've checked all the boxes. And so I'm coming before you asking you this question I already know the answer to. I am righteous and so I'm, I'm doing the right things. It's interesting after he says that, how Jesus responds to in Mark chapter 10, verses 21 and 22, he says, and Jesus looked at him. When Jesus says Jesus looked at him, it was like Jesus looked right into his soul. Like he looked into his heart. He looked into the place where he was being held captive, right? And then check this out. It says, he loved him. He loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. 
Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. <laughs> Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked right into the place that the man was being held captive. And you know what? In that moment, Jesus didn't say, man, you're not righteous. He didn't start condemning the man. What he did is show him his fault. Why did he do that? Because he loved him. And it's interesting that it says he looked at him, loved him, and then he said. Because the Bible tells us that we're to speak the truth in love, but it's through love that we speak the truth. Like in other words, love compels us to tell people the real story. Like, like we, need, we don't want to fall, uh, follow somebody's false narrative or somebody's false, you know, faulty systems and, and uh, you know, comply with these things as if that's loving. What's loving is to tell people the truth, not to lie to them and give them false hope. It's unloving to go along with a false narrative. Jesus tells this man, you're lacking one thing. And the way that he reveals this is to ask him for what? For his money. Jesus says, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. His response to what Jesus is asking to him is going to reveal his heart. Jesus knew his issue, just like he knows yours, and how he looks into your heart, and how he loves you. And then he says to you the truth. He tells you the truth. This hit the man right where he needed to be hit. The account goes on to say the young man went away sad because he had great possessions. What Jesus was saying is, Sir, you don't keep all the commandments. In fact, the one commandment that you're in violation of is commandment number one. You have another God before you. Your God is your finances, and I'm revealing that to you, not because I need to know it, but because you need to know it. And don't you love the Lord because he, does, he reveals our sticking points in our walk with him? Like he tells us the truth, and he wants us to grow through the kinds of things. If we have a false God in our life, the Lord is faithful to reveal it to us. Whether or not we listen to him or we're willing to hear him is a different story. But God is faithful to reveal those things. You know, when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, it's an emphatic statement, absolute truth, you cannot serve God and money. And Jesus shined the lights right into the, the pain point of this man's life. And it says that he went away sad. He was not willing to give up his false God to follow Jesus. And Jesus was faithful to show him the condition of his heart. And he used money to do that. Do you know he, Jesus uses, the Lord uses all kinds of different things to reveal our hearts. He might even use your children. Oh, wait a second here. He did it with Abraham. Remember, it's, it's very easy to put your children on the throne of your heart. It very, very easy because we love them so much. I have four kids and I love them, but none of them sit on the throne of my heart. My family does not revolve around my children. My family revolves around my God. And then my wife is number two and my children are number three. And that is the priority that God has given us in his word, you know. Uh, when, when God told Abraham, hey, I want you to take your only begotten son, not even acknowledging Ishmael, by the way, because that was a son birthed in the flesh. But, I, but the son that I gave you, I want you to take him up uh, on the mount and I want you to sacrifice him as a sacrifice to me. Why would God ask for such a thing? Because that was one of the ways that the Lord reveals the heart of man to man. God wasn't doing it to, to wonder what Abraham was going to do. He knew what he was going to do. But he was showing Abraham what he was going to do. Abraham was a man of faith. And he trusted God with something that was so near and dear to his heart that he would ask him this. And he was found faithful in the moment. The Lord uses all kinds of things to reveal our hearts. So let me ask you a question. Are you willing to follow Jesus above all else? What if he asked you to sell everything that you have? Would you do it? It's, I think it's a good thing to contemplate. No one's asking you to do that here today, by the way, unless the Lord is, but I'm not. But here's the reality of it. These are the kinds of things that we use to examine our heart to see if we're in the faith. 
to see where we're at. We need to constantly ask ourselves questions. You know what happens with most of us is we put it in neutral and we say, we got Jesus, now we're good. No, we should be in a constant stage of examination. Is my heart belong to the Lord? It, do I continue to, you know, not, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about your daily walk with the Lord. Is he really leading me or am I leading him? And the way that you come to the, the conclusion, the way that God reveals his heart to you is through asking yourself these kinds of questions. Would I? And of course, we would all say probably on the surface, well, yeah, I would. I mean, it's the Lord. I would do uh, whatever it is that he'd ask me to do. And here's what I would say to you is all you have to do to answer that question honestly is to look at what you're doing right now. Because what you're doing right now is exactly what you'll do whenever the Lord asks you to do something. If you're not walking in obedience with the Lord right now, he's already asked you to give. He's already said that that's something that we should do. If you're not doing it now, what in the world makes you think that you'll do it then? I mean, you're not gonna change anything. You're just gonna keep on with the same patterns. And so... What the Lord is asking you to do is examine your heart. Are you obedient to him? Are you willing to do all that the Lord would ask you to do? Now, you might be saying, well, well, I would, Pastor Tim, but in times are tough and inflation is up and uh, I just don't have any extra now. And I would say, oh, is that how we give? Based on the excess of what we have in our lives? That's, again, uh, not a, a biblical premise. And in fact, Jesus says this. You recall the account of uh, the poor widow in Luke chapter 21. Jesus' and disciples are in the court of the women in the temple where the treasury is and they're observing people giving. And these wealthy people are coming in with trucks load of, truck loads of cash and they're making a big parade and a processionals about their giving. They're drawing attention to themselves. There's lots of oohs and ahs in the crowd as they bring their offering to the Lord and such. And Jesus and his disciples are just observing. And after the big parade of the wealthy come through, here comes this little poor widow lady. And you got to wonder what people are thinking. They're thinking, what in the world does she have to offer God? We can clearly see she's poor. She has nothing to offer the Lord. Why, why is she even bothering going to the treasury here? And she comes up to the, to, the, to the offering box there and she drops in two mites, which is basically the equivalent of a penny. Drops in a penny and you could hear people probably gasping like how embarrassing that she would give God that. And do you know Jesus, the only one that he speaks about in that moment of all of the people who were giving in that moment was her. He drew his disciples' attention to her. And he says in Luke chapter 21, verse 3 and 4, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, listen, put in some of all that she had? No, put in all she had to live on. It's not about the amount of what you're giving. That doesn't impress God, folks. What impresses God is when we give out of sacrifice because we want to be obedient to him. Giving out of very little is impressive to God. Well, not only is, is a giving an act of worship and is it a matter of obedience, but giving is also a stewardship issue. Do you know all of your resources are God's? The Bible makes that super plain. It reminds me of a story that I heard about a little boy who was at church one Sunday and his mom said, here, go put, the, put, put your money in the offering box. She's training her child, you know, in this principle of giving and he comes up to the box and he's having a hard time putting his money in there. And he's like, oh, I don't want to do it. And his mom says, you know, Timmy, that, that's tainted. Let it go. And he's shocked and he drops the money in the box and as he's walking away from his mom, he says, Mom, what do you mean it's tainted? Is that money dirty? And she said, no, it taint yours and it taint mine. It's God's. So that's one way to illustrate the point. But the scriptures do talk about this. In fact, Moses, writing in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 through 18, he says this, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may, uh, 
con- confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Moses is warning the children of Israel not to forget where all of their resources come. You know, the, 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 the special gifting that you have or the intuitiveness that you have to be able to, uh, you know, do your job and, and to excel in, in financially and stuff, you know, that comes from the Lord. And don't ever forget that. The Lord gives you the ability to do everything that you do. And so, you know, the Lord wants you to know that. And so, if that's the case, if the Lord gives you uh, the ability to do everything, what does that make you then? That makes you a steward of what God has given you. Listen to 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 through 12. It says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Last time I checked, the word all in the Bible means all. It's not, not, you're not the anomaly there. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. Again, what are these verses saying about their, our resources, that they all belong to God? What does that make you? Makes you a steward, doesn't it? Paul points uh, this points to this fact in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He said, what do you have that you did not receive? And then you received it. If you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You guys get the point. Listen, giving to the Lord is not only an act of worship or a matter of obedience, but it's also a stewardship issue. What the Lord's given you, he wants you to manage well. And he wants you to do great things with it. So that's the base that I want to lay before we move into our text this morning. I've divided these four verses up into four sections relating to giving. First, we find the purpose. Look at verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. The phrase now concerning right here should cue us in to the idea that Paul is answering a question that's been asked of him. You're not just randomly bringing it up. We haven't talked about giving for a while, so we better just bring it up, you know. No, he's answering a question from them. And in fact, this phrase is used four times in the book of 1 Corinthians. This is the fourth time. The first time we see it, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And we talked about when we came to this passage that there was a letter that had been written to Paul that we have no, uh, you know, there's no... uh, um, evidence of it other than this passage that it was written to him and Paul is now answering their questions. It's the first time we see this phrase used, now concerning. Then again, 1 Corinthians 8.1, now concerning food offered to idols. They were asking questions about that. 1 Corinthians 12.1, now concerning spiritual gifts. They were asking questions about that. And here in 1 Corinthians 16.1, now concerning the collection for the saints. They had a question about what it is that they were to do relating to this collection that they're being called to take. This collection is a reference to uh, the, 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 the offering that was being taken by Paul uh, on his third missionary journey. This is when it started, and he went, went through Macedonia, Ki, uh, the churches of Galatia. He was asking people to take up an offering for the church in Jerusalem. We know he's talking about that because in verse 3 it says that. So it says that he's going to Jerusalem. This is about the church in Jerusalem. Well, what's the deal with the church in Jerusalem? Why why do they need an offering taken up? Because the church in Jerusalem was dealing with extreme poverty uh, for several reasons. First and foremost, it was probably residual effects from the, from the famine that had occurred. Uh, you recall that when we went through the book of Acts, Agabus prophesied a worldwide famine in Acts chapter 11, verse 28, And so there was just in general a famine that had come through the world and it probably created a lot of financial devastation as famines tend to do. Secondly, the church in Jerusalem we know was heavily persecuted. You know, from the time that Jesus showed up on the scene all the way up until Paul is writing this, the church has been persecuted massively. And during the persecution of the church in Jerusalem, what was happening is people were getting their properties taken away, their possessions taken away. They were losing their jobs. They were being blacklisted. They weren't able to make a living for themselves. And so believers were in big trouble. When it, when, if you stayed in Jerusalem and that was your means of making a living, it was difficult for you. 
Not only that, but you recall when the great awakening happened in Acts chapter 2, where you had all these pilgrims that were coming, these Jew, P, Jewish people who were coming from all different places to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, you know? And the Holy Spirit blew in the upper room. Uh, these guys begin to speak in tongues. Peter gets down and he gives a message and 3,000 people get saved. Well, there was many, many people during that time that stayed in Jerusalem and they stayed because there was no other church to go to. Do you know if you got saved in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, it's not like you could just go home and join the church. The church didn't exist in your hometown. And in fact, it was so localized that if you wanted to grow in your faith, you needed to stay in Jerusalem and sit under the um, discipleship of the apostles. So if you went, if you went back home, then guess what? You're kind of, you're kind of like not going to be discipled. And you're not going to grow in your faith. And there was no scripture to read, really. And there was, there was no way to really make that happen. So they stayed there. Well, what happened as a response of that is you have this influx of people that are now dependent on the church to take care of them. So we see in Acts chapter, you know, four and such, we see that the people begin to sell their homes and they begin to give the funds to the apostles so that they can take care of the people that are there. The church is caring for the church. And that's the way that it should be. But the problem is that their resources eventually ran out. And so there was, there was really no more resources that they had to lean on. So for this reason, these reasons and many more, many of the believers in Jerusalem were extremely poor and the church was doing everything that it could to help them. The Lord had put it on the Apostle Paul's heart to take a collection for this church and to bring it to them to support the church in Jerusalem. What an amazing thing. Now, this is conjecture on my part, so take it as that. But, you know, perhaps the reason, one of the reasons Paul was so compelled was because he was one of the, one of the main contributors to the persecution that happened to the church in Jerusalem. It was by his hand that people died. Families were split apart, where, you know, people were imprisoned and possessions were taken and all of this kind of stuff. And he thought he was doing it in the name of the, the, the Yahweh. He thought he was doing it on the name of the, the God of Israel. And yet he found out later on the road to Damascus that the one whom he was coming against was Jesus. He was persecuting the Lord. And so perhaps that's one of the reasons why Paul uh, wanted to uh, contribute to the church in Jerusalem because he felt personally responsible. But what we do know for sure is that Paul had a love for his countrymen. And most of the believers in Jerusalem at this time were Jewish. It's not like Gentile people moved to Jer Jerusalem to join the church. The, the church was being birthed in Gentile lands. And so God sent Paul outside of Israel to go take the, take the gospel to the nations, take the gospel to the Gentiles. But the, ch the church early on was primarily Jewish. That's why they had so many problems with how do we deal with this Gentile church? Paul loved his countrymen so much so that he was said, man, I would give my own life if they would come to Christ. He loved people. He loved others. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we give. It's, it's, it's be, for the sake of other people. And that's his point here. We're, we're to give for the sake of others. And we have an obligation to do that. I love the way that John MacArthur breaks down the purpose here. He says, the primary purpose of giving as taught in the New Testament is for the support of the saints. A Christian's first obligation is to support fellow believers individually and collectively. The church's first financial responsibility is to invest in its own life and its own people. Obviously, that is not the only economic obligation we have. The parable of the Good Samaritan makes it clear that we should minister personally and financially to anyone in need, regardless of religion, culture, or circumstances. And so the, the purpose of giving in this context is for the sake of others. And you know, isn't that the, the, one of the premises of our lives, that we're to live for other people? We're to keep others the focus of our lives, not ourselves, but other people, that we would live and be sacrificial for others? Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Do you imagine if Jesus was living for himself? <laughs> While he was here, he's just like, I'm just doing my thing, living for myself. He probably wouldn't have went to the cross. In fact, he probably wouldn't have came. But Philippians chapter two tells us that Jesus emptied himself of his glory. Why? Because he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. He kept others 
the primary focus, and it was others that fueled Jesus to do everything that he did. It was the will of the Father and the love for other people that Jesus did everything that he did. What's fueling your life? Do you love other people like that? Are you you willing to sacrifice for others like the Lord has done for you? Listen, we are to help out fellow believers as we can. Paul says this same kind of a thing in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. I think it's interesting what Paul is saying here. He's talking about helping out, not necessarily individuals, but a church. Wait, a church is going to help a church. Hey, you know what? What, a, what an awesome thing that we see here modeled in our scriptures that churches aren't competing with each other. They're helping each other. Wouldn't that be awesome to see in our culture today where churches aren't going like this, like this is my little kingdom and I have this and I don't want to help you do what God's calling you to do there. And so everybody's duplicating their efforts. And, you know, and, it, and it, honestly, the resources that require each person to start from ground zero when you could all come, when you could come together collectively and do certain things to accomplish the same thing, how amazing it would be if the church would come together and would unify in that way, and that we would help one another. I don't, I don't know many, many churches that help other churches do anything. There's, there's a few. There's a, there's a few churches. In fact, Troy Warner, who just came here uh, several weeks ago a, a, after our men's conference, he taught our services. Uh, his, he go, gets together with his board. He, um, he kind of oversees a lot of the um, smaller Calvary Chapel plants up in uh, Virginia. And you know what? They, on a monthly basis, go through and they give to these churches to help them. You know, as a church, they're giving to these churches so that they can keep their doors open so that, uh, you know, the, the, the work can continue to be done. And I think it's a model of really what Jesus wants for us. Like we would love each other in such a way that we would, we would come together as churches and we would be able to help each other. He said it like this in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When the church treats the church like it ought to, the world takes notice, for sure. Paul is saying, hey, we're taking this collection up together as a church to help another church. So the question that these guys are asking seems to be related to, okay, we know we're to take a collection up, but how do we do it? And so Paul moves on in verse two to give us the principles of giving. Look at verse two. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. There's four principles that Paul lays out in this one verse relating to uh, the principles of giving. Paul begins by the first principle laying out the principle of pattern. Notice what he says here. It was on the first day of every week. What day is that? Monday? It's Monday, right? No, it's Sunday. The first day of the week is Sunday. And, uh, you know, just a side note, but that's why we meet on Sundays, because the early church met on Sundays. Why did the early church meet on Sundays? Probably because Jesus Christ rose from the dead on Sundays. It's a tradition. And I say that because some people act like it's commanded in the, in the word to meet on Sundays. It's not. It's tradition. And we should treat it as such. Do you know you can worship God on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday too? It doesn't have to be on, on Sundays. And in fact, you should be worshiping the Lord every day of the week. But there should be a corporate gathering. And what Paul is saying, here is the pattern that, that you should follow. Every week when you gather together, giving should be a primary focus. Uh, it should be one of the things that you're doing in your corporate gatherings. That means when you come to church, you should be thinking about other people. And how can I contribute, um, Lord, to to this? And, uh, you know, it's an amazing thing when people have their minds off themselves. They have their minds on other people. God has given you uh, incredible gifting. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you have incredible gifting. And if you come to church with that mentality that I'm here to be a giver, then God is going to use you in extraordinary ways. 
He's going to give you words of knowledge, words of wisdom, going to give you the ability to pray over people. Perhaps he gives you the gift of healing. We believe in that. But if you come here to get something from God, then you're going to miss the opportunity to give something. And so the mentality should be, I'm here to give. Every week we gather, I'm here to give. I'm here to give glory to you, Lord. I'm here to give to the body of Christ. I'm here to give because God is a giver and we should be givers. And so Paul says the principle of that giving should be done in this pattern. It should be done every week. So as you gather together, there should be an offering taken up on a weekly basis. That's the pattern that we follow. The second principle that he lays out here is the principle of personal uh, responsibility. He goes on to say, each of you is to put something aside and store it up. That is to say, everyone should give something. No one is excused from contributing is what Paul's saying here. And that's the same thing that he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, where he says, everyone must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. But here's the premise. Everyone should give. It's not something that, um, you know, only a few people should do. Everyone should decide in their heart what they're going to give, and they should give. And this is across the board. Paul saying the same thing in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, as he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, that each of us has a personal responsibility relating to this giving. Paul goes on to give us a third principle, which is the principle of proportionate giving. Continuing on in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, 16, 2, he says, as he may prosper. In other words, you should give in accordance to the proportion of what you have received. And in fact, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 confirms this. Listen, I want to set you free this morning relating to this whole giving thing. Listen to me. The New Testament mandate for giving is not tied to a percentage. You know, you're not under the law. The law, it's not been abolished, but it's been fulfilled. And if you want to be a law keeper, then if you'll go back and study the Old Testament, you'll realize if I really want to follow the law in this regard, I should be giving 23%, not 10 because that's what the nation of Israel was required to do. And in fact, if you understand the whole giving process in the Old Testament, it was primarily taxes that were being paid for the nation. It was funds that were being, part of it was funds being given to the Levites to take care of them. And part of it, every three years, they were required to give a 10% tithe for foreigners that were coming in, kind of a benevolence ministry for the Levites to be able to help other people that would need help. And so if you take all of that collectively together and extrapolate it out, it would be about 23% per year. That's the, if you want to be a rule taker, then that's what you should do. But you don't have to be. Because the New Testament mandate of giving isn't tied to a percentage. It's tied to what you've decided to give in your heart. And if your heart belongs to the Lord, he'll tell you exactly what you should do. You don't have to just give 10%. I mean, you can give 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. You can give as much as you want or as little as you want. That's up to you. And it's between you and the Lord. We are not under the law. But here's, you know, tying into what I said earlier in my sermon. However, there is a circle of blessing and giving. And Paul makes mention of this right before he says that each one must give in accordance with what he's decided to give in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, he says this first, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The idea is that when we give to the Lord and we give cheerfully and we give without any strings attached, God doesn't need your strings. You know, God, I'm going to give because I want to get. We don't do that. God gives when he wants to give and he does it exactly the way he wants to do it. But he does tell us there's a principle in when we give to the Lord, however we give to the Lord, it'll be returned to us. Matthew 7 says the same thing. You know, the, this, the, the Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Solomon says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And so the idea is that there's a circle of blessing and giving. God is a debtor to no man. And when you come with the right heart and you give to the Lord freely, the Lord returns and he blesses. 
But that's not why we do it. We do it because it's an act of worship. It's a matter of obedience and because we're stewards of all that God has given us. Well, this brings us to our final point here of the how-to guide of the principles being laid out here in verse two, and it's the principle of privacy. Paul goes on to say, put something aside weekly so that there will be no collection when I come. Do you guys know what, the, what command presence is? Command presence is uh, basically a person's ability to just stand before people and sway them based on their presence, command presence. Paul has command presence in the church. If Paul shows up and he says, okay, guys, break out your wallets, we're gonna take an offering, guess what? He's gonna sway the people to give way more than they would, than they would normally give. Paul understanding this says, I don't wanna even be part of it. I don't wanna be present when you give. Here's how you do it. Now you privately go do it between you and God. And you give the way that you want to give to the Lord. And, and that way, I'm not swaying you to do anything. This is your act of worship to God. This is your obedience to the Lord. This is your stewardship of the Lord. So you decide what you're going to do with the Lord, and you do it privately. And that's primarily why we don't pass a plate here. You know, uh, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but, but one of the reasons we don't do that is because we don't want to force anybody to give anything. I, I've been a tipper in my life before. What does that mean? You know, when the plate comes by, you feel obligated to do it, so you put a tip in. You know, just like, here's five bucks, Lord. Here's a $5 tip, Lord. You know, it's like the waitress at the table. You know, you're going to give her something. Well, the plate's coming. The camera's on you. I mean, everybody's looking at you. You're on the screen. You're like, where's my wallet? And you can see him scrambling for it. Uh, that's why we don't do that. And I'm not, listen, giving is a part of worship. But we just choose not to do it that way. What we've chosen to do is put a box in the back, and it's just between you and the Lord. When you come to worship the Lord, you come and you can put your offering in there. If you do it online, then you can go online and you can do that. I, I struggle with that a little bit because it, I feel a disconnect, just as me personally. I feel a disconnect when I, when I put my thing on auto pay and I'm not thinking about it, it's just happening. I want to be conscious of it because it's a joy for me. It's a joy for me to give to the Lord. And so I like that idea of doing that, and um, it's, it's not right or wrong. It's, it's private. It's between you and the Lord. That's just me. But, but the whole concept of this is that, you know, you decide in your own heart. Paul doesn't want anybody giving reluctantly or under compulsion. He doesn't want people feeling pressure to do anything. He's just saying, you and the Lord decide what you're going to do, and then you do it, and you stick to it, and you just walk by faith in that, in that stuff. So we keep it privately, yes, in the way that we honor the Lord in our giving, in our corporate worship, but we also keep it, keep it private in general. Like in other words, I have no idea who gives what, and I like that because that keeps me free from the temptation that every human being would have uh, to want to minister to people who maybe give more than others. I don't want to, I'm a human being and I don't want that pressure. And so we've chosen just to say, hey, I don't want to know anything. And in fact, our elders don't know who gives what. We all know what the overall number is. How do we know who? Well, there's one guy that knows, and he's got to know so he can put it in our system so that he can keep track of it. But, but we chose to do it that way because we want to keep that as private as possible. It's between you and God. There's no pressure here. You know? And when you truly understand how um, you know, the, what, the whole concept of giving in the Bible, man, you'll be blessed by it. I went from being a person who had the preconceived idea that all the church cares about is money to going, man, it's my joy to write my check to the Lord. I love it. It's just something I enjoy doing because it's an act of worship to the Lord. Well, Paul moves on now to giving the protocol of giving in verse three. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. One thing that you should always consider when you're giving to a ministry uh, is what kind of accountability do they have in place? Like, what is the protocol? How do they handle the money? What Paul is saying is, when I show up, you're not going to hand me a bag of cash and go, here, Paul, go take this to Jerusalem. He's like, I'm not doing that. Number one, because I want accountability for the, those funds. 
not just for himself, but also for his haters. Because the last thing Paul wants to do is have this spread across all of Macedonia and Achaia and, and in Galatia that all Paul cares about is your money. He's coming to get your money and he's taking cash from all these people and it's never gonna make its way to Jerusalem. Do you know how hard it would be to control that narrative in that culture? It's hard enough in our culture and we can digitally get on and try and correct stuff and it still doesn't work. Could you imagine back in this day there were lies being spread all over the place? You know, about Paul already. He said, listen, here's my protocol when it comes to giving. You delegate people who are going to go on your behalf to Jerusalem, and they're going to carry the money. And I'm going to give them a letter that says, here, these people are from the church in Corinth. They're sent by me. Uh, you know, they're here to, here to extend the hand of grace. And I also think one of the reasons why Paul did that is because he wants to bridge the gap. He wants to break down the cultural barrier between Gentiles and Jews. That is very present in this moment. When Paul's writing this, there's still that, that concept of, you know, Jews think Gentiles are firewood for hell. They're having a hard time cons- having this concept that G- Gentiles could even get saved. You know, you're a Gentile, you know. If you're not a Jew here, you're a Gentile. So that, would, that, that was the mentality. And Paul is saying, no, the gospel changes everything. There's no longer Jew or Gentile or slave or free. It, it's all been changed because of what Jesus has done. And so he wants to start to begin to build the bridge between the Gentiles and the Jews. And this is one way that he could do that is to, um, nothing says I love you more than saying here I care for you and I want to help you. You know, the the extended hand uh, to say I love you is amazing because love is an action. And so, but Paul doesn't want to be responsible for the money. So his protocol is you, um, you guys send guys and, and such, and, you know, uh, our protocol and the way that we handle all the funds that come in here is we put, we have a budget. I put a budget together. We have a board of directors that approves that budget. And so once I give the board of directors the budget, here's kind of what we think we need to operate under. They, they ask me a bunch of questions and, you know, what, are, what is this for? Why are we doing this? And all that kind of stuff. And then we set the budget and I have accountability to that budget by three guys that are outside of our church and, and Alan Buckley's one of our board members. So we have four board members besides myself. And they are responsible to keep us accountable financially. Not only do we have that, but we also have a third party CPA who does, examines our books every quarter to go through our line items and say like, hey Tim, what is this uh, pastor's trip to Hawaii for? Why are you, what is that all about? You know, keep me accountable. Make sure I'm not, there's no funny business going on around here. But, but that's, that's, that's the way, that's the protocol that we have put in place. And so Paul is just saying, you know, this is the way that I want to handle this. And so that's the protocol of giving. And finally, we come to the perspective of giving. Look at verse four. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Peter, Paul is simply saying, I'm going to send letters to carry this gift um, for them to accompany with, but if it seems advisable that I should go, then I'll go. What he's, what he's saying is, here's my protocol, this is the way I handle it, but I'm flexible. And it's so important that we're flexible in the way that we do things. Our perspective, listen, your entire life should have this one perspective, not my will, but your will be done. And that's essentially what Paul is saying here. I have a plan, and this is the way I'm going to do it. But if God calls an audible in my life and tells me to go, I'll go. I'm flexible. I love Pastor Chuck used to say, blessed are the flexible, for they can't be broken. And, you know, we need to be flexible. How many of you guys have ever set a plan in order and it, it worked out exactly the way that you planned it? Anybody ever done that before? You have. You're the only one. Praise the Lord. But I have never, none of my plans have ever worked out exactly the way that they, they, they could have. I guess if you're walking in the Spirit, you will, it will be exact. But I, I'm just kind of going off of, Lord, here's kind of what I think. Here's the parameters. But I have to remain flexible. Because I can't foresee the future. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. And if you want to walk in the will of God, you have to be flexible. You can't be rigid in your plans. I'm going to do this. And so oftentimes we're in places where God doesn't want us to be. And he's telling us over and over again. But we're so rigid in our plan that we won't move. And you know what? 
that's a terrible place to be. Because what you're saying is, I'm in control, and I'm, gonna, I'm not moving. And I am not saying that any adversity in your life means God's trying to move you somewhere else, because we're called to endure suffering. Like, it's part of life. But you have to ask yourself the question at times, am I, going, am I kicking against the goads like Paul was with Jesus? Am I kicking against the goads, Lord? Listen, we need to remain, uh, have that perspective of not my will, but your will be done. In closing, I just want to say that, listen, God is not broke. (laughs) Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad God isn't dependent on you to fund the things that he does? We have a mentality here at our church. We say where God guides, he provides. And whatever the Lord wants to do, he'll do. And if you're, if you're sitting under the mentality of people who are saying, you know, if you don't give this week, we're going to go off the air. Or if you don't give this week, we're going to have to shut the doors down. Here's what I found is don't pump money into something that God is causing to die. If, the, if we were ever in a position where the Lord wanted to shut the doors, you should never pump money into that. You should ask the Lord, are you in this or are you not in this? And if you're not in this, I don't want to be in this. Because it's about your plan. God's not broke. He doesn't beg his people for money. The Lord has given us a mandate to give. He's written it in his word. And now he leaves it up to you to respond to that. And it's, it's your personal matter before the Lord. So you do as the Lord directs you. Here's what I want to leave you with. The only thing that God is after is your heart. That's the only thing God is after. And if God has your heart, everything else will fall in line. 